Hello, my name is Amelia Song and this is Sex Studies. Here we're going to be talking about one of my favorite topics, sexology. It's not just about the birds and the bees or how to put a condom on or STIs. This is the study of sex and sexuality through the eyes of science. So sit up straight, grab a pen and paper, and let's talk about sex. Sex Studies is a series dedicated to studying sexology, the scientific study of human sexuality. It's a multidisciplinary field that includes biology, psychology, sociology, anthropology, and pretty much any other ology that you can think of that investigates human interactions. As a sex worker, I have heard some of the strangest misconceptions about sex, and this lack of information can seriously impact your health in negative ways. There are already some great videos out there that explore the basics of sex from how to give the perfect blowjob to what are the different symptoms of STIs. I've included some of my favorite channels in the linky links below, so please check those out. But I wanted to go deeper than that, not just explore the what, but also the why and the how, to look at sex from an academic perspective. Now, I'm not a sexologist, I don't have a PhD, and I don't have any formal training as a researcher or a therapist, but I have been doing a lot of reading lately. So think of this more like an independent study group than a formal course. But before we delve into the studies and the conclusions that they've drawn, first we need a bit of context. Writings about human sexuality have existed since ancient times, from Sappho of Lesbos' erotic poems to the Kama Sutra, a practical guide to fulfilling desire, one of Hinduism's four life goals. But researching sex using empirical methodology has only been around since the 19th century. The first known sex study was conducted in 1830s Paris by Alexandre Jean-Baptiste Perrin du Châtelet. His study, Prostitution in the City of Paris, was published posthumously in 1836. It examined the lives of over 5,000 sex workers, examining, among other things, the family backgrounds of prostitutes and what compelled people to sell sexual services. This was the first of many studies that relied heavily on the sex work community and remains one of the largest studies on sex to date. It was also one of the first empirical studies of sociology, helping to lay the foundation for future studies of sex and a multitude of other sociological topics. Perrin du Châtelet also realized that a lot of people lie about their sex lives, a problem that continues to plague sex researchers to this day. Skipping forward a few decades, in 1886, Austro-German psychiatrist Richard von Kraft Ebbing published the first edition of Psychopathia Sexualis, a clinical forensic study. Psychopathia Sexualis examines what von Kraft Ebbing, and European society at large, deemed sexual perversions. By its 12th edition, Psychopathia Sexualis contained 238 individual case studies, covering everything from same-sex relations to pedophilia. It was written as a reference for doctors and judges on sexual pathology so they could better understand sex criminals and those they considered mentally ill. Psychopathia Sexualis was intentionally written to be a dull read to discourage your average Johan from picking up a copy. While he popularized terms like homosexuality, heterosexuality, bisexuality, sadism, and masochism, von Kraft Ebbing believed that all sexual acts, aside from procreative sex, were perversions, and he was not a fan of some of the frisky fun that his patients were getting up to. The study of human sexuality has long been influenced by societal norms and so-called moral standards, whether the researchers report their findings through the lens of their culture's morality or by outright rejecting mainstream conceptions. Von Kraft Ebbing was soon overshadowed by another Austrian psychologist I'm sure you've already heard of, Sigmund Freud. So we now know that Freud was wrong about quite a lot of things to do with sex, but his views were very popular in the early 20th century. His notions reinforced and introduced a plethora of myths that sexologists are still trying to debunk. In the 1890s, Freud hypothesized that hysteria, a sexually aggressive and excessively emotional disorder found primarily in women, and obsessional neurosis, an anxiety disorder with symptoms similar to obsessive compulsive disorder, were caused by early childhood sexual abuse. Though he claimed to have empirical data to back up his claims, he never publicized his evidence and abandoned the hypothesis in 1897 in favor of a new one, infantile sexuality. According to Freud's new hypothesis, mental illnesses were caused by the failure to satisfy one's sex drive during childhood, thus causing a child to obsess over a particular erogenous zone. Freud believed that children experience psychosexual development in five stages, oral, 
anal, phallic, latency, and genital. He hypothesized that the disruption of any of these phases would lead to a fixation that continues into adulthood, leading to mental maladies like neurosis, hysteria, and personality disorders. The oral stage occurs for the first year of a person's life. He believed that all infants experience pleasure by suckling their mother's breasts and putting objects in their mouths. A disruption of this phase can cause a person to develop a manipulative, gullible, passive, immature personality. The second phase occurs until the child is three and is called the anal stage. At this age, children focus on bowel and bladder elimination, in other words, the potty training years. He believed that overemphasizing the importance of hygiene can cause a person to become a compulsive neat freak, whereas underemphasizing hygiene can lead to a slovenly, self-indulgent personality. Now, you've probably heard a little something about stage three already, the phallic stage, in which children seek sexual possession of their mothers. From ages 3 to 6, children become aware of gender roles and the physical differences between males and females. Freud proposed that boys experience the Oedipus complex during this stage, in which they are drawn to their mothers to satisfy their libidos, thus developing rivalries with their fathers as both of them vie for her attention. Freud's student Carl Jung proposed a counter to the Oedipus complex, the Electra complex. Freud rejected the terminology, favoring the term feminine Oedipus attitude when describing stage 3 development for girls. He believed that girls experience penis envy because they cannot sexually possess their moms. Instead, girls focus their energy on their fathers, creating a rivalry with their mothers for his affection. Freud hypothesized that children's libidos diminish from age 6 to puberty, thus resulting in stage 4, latency. During this stage, children should gain pleasure from non-libidinal stimuli like friendship, playing games, and attending school. He believed that childhood neurosis was the result of a child's inability to move past the first three stages as they enter the fourth. Stage 5, the genital stage, starts during puberty. As children transition to adulthood, they reconnect with their genitalia as the primary erogenous zone. Satisfying one's libido now relies on sexual interactions between consenting adults that combine intellectual and emotional desires with the instinct to have sex, rather than the base, solitary sexual experiences that children face. Freud believed that girls' primary erogenous zone would naturally shift from the clitoris to the vagina by stage 5, claiming that clitoral orgasms were an immature form of sexual gratification and that mature women should instead focus on vaginal orgasms. He even advocated for female genital mutilation in order to further girls' development should they pay too much attention to their clits. This denial of female sexuality led Western doctors to prescribe clitoral circumcision for numerous mental illnesses through the 1950s. We'll soon learn about the differences between vaginal and clitoral orgasms and why denying clitoral stimulation as a form of sexual gratification is, you know, bullshit. Today we can all acknowledge that Freud's hypotheses on sexuality and gender development are largely unsubstantiated. In 1924, one of his first notable critics, yet another German psychoanalyst, Karen Horney, argued that penis envy among girls was not an inherently occurring phenomenon, but rather one imposed upon female children by their parents and society at large. Through her studies of Freud's publications and personal experience with psychoanalysis, Horney concluded that Freudian psychology was too androcentric to accurately understand or represent women's experiences. She countered Freud's penis envy with what she called womb envy, a man's envy of women's ability to bear children. She believed that womb envy propelled men to compensate for their inability to bear children by striving for success in other realms. Horney believed that female children may become insecure with their femininity if they perceive that their father's love is waning, as he expresses love for another woman, usually her mother. She rejected the Freudian notion that little girls wanted sexual possession of their mothers and believed that abnormal personality traits, lack of interest in pursuing men, or aggressive competitiveness when pursuing men, was the result of a woman's loss of her father's love, whether real or perceived. Unlike Freud, Horney believed that men and women were mentally equal, and that female oppression was the true cause behind what many perceived as female inferiority. She believed that most girls developed a masculinity complex, the disdain for the female sex, not because of some inherent desire for a penis, but rather because society demeaned women. Horney posited that poor mental health was determined by whether or not a person's basic needs are met as a child, regardless of sex or gender. Though her views were unpopular at the time, Horney's theory on childhood maltreatment is still accepted as one of the causes of mental illness. 
Her hypotheses helped shift the way that psychology examines gender differences, looking at environmental factors rather than assuming that the differences between boys and girls are biological. Her teachings, which were decades before her time, laid much of the groundwork for legitimizing female sexuality, paving a path for gender equality and the second wave feminist movement. Next episode, we'll get into the sciencey bits, or rather, the science about your bits. So, whether you're a sexual veteran or just dipping your toes in the erotic water for the first time, I hope you'll join me as we continue to explore the hows and the whys of sex. Stay sexy! Thank you for watching the first episode of my new series. Please hit those like and subscribe buttons and share this with your friends so we can spread the knowledge. You can follow me on the twit twat at studies underscore sex, and if you really like what you see, you can become a Patreon patron at patreon.com slash sexstudies. First level of membership is just $2 per month.